Welcome to episode 51 of the CanadaFootballChat.com Recruiting Masters Podcast, brought to you by the CFC Insider. Well, Katie and Clint, and you're listening to the number one place for all your football recruiting and prospect news across Canada. If you're listening to the show for the first time, welcome. We're glad you've joined us. Be sure to follow us on our Facebook, Twitter, at ChatFootball, Instagram, CFC underscore football, and YouTube, as well as check out our digital store on CanadaFootballChat.com. We have some fantastic recruiting resources on there, such as the NCAA and Youth Sports Recruiting Guides. Um, there's a film analysis resource there with Clint, uh, who helps break down your um, your game film and gives you some uh, a scouting report card. It's a great a great tool to have. And then we've also got some other really good uh, CFC merchandise and things like that. So today we are doing our NC, another episode of our NCAA edition. Um, we've got. Quincy Ford, who's on the line, and he, he tracks all of our Canadian prospects down in the down south. Um, we're going to be talking about five of those prospects today. Um, it's a little bit of a, a curious situation with the recent cancellations of various conferences down south. It's anyone's guess to see or uh, what the fall is going to be like. Quincy, um, welcome. First of all, how are you? I'm good. How are you? We're good. So you know. You, You've been kind of following this maybe a little more closely than we have, per se. What are your general thoughts on what the college football season may look like? And maybe give us the landscape of who's playing and who, who's bowing out and that, all that good stuff. Yeah, it's definitely really interesting because some of the guys we're going to be talking about today are still trying to play in the poll, whereas some have, have no chance of playing in the poll. But as for the FBS conferences... It's interesting. It's kind of a split. Four conferences uh, have canceled their full season while six are still trying to play. Like we have the Big Ten, Pac-12, Mountain West, and Mid-American conferences have all canceled. Well, in some capacity, the rest of the other six, so SEC, ACC, Big 12, Conference USA, Sunbelt, and American Athletic Conference are still trying to play. So however that goes... It's, uh, I don't, um, I mean, I've read a couple things from Nick Saban that he's put out and, you know, he, he's been putting arguments for it, you know, while everyone else seems to be roasting them, but I just don't see the SEC not playing. Like, they're going to play. Yeah. <laughs> them and the ACC. Yeah, that, yeah. that's a priority for them. <laughs> well, there's big money, right? Like. TV broadcast rights and all that kind of stuff. And not to say that the student athlete isn't the most important piece, but. Yeah, it's certainly interesting. Like even, even the schedule, like for ACC, I mean, sorry, for SEC, they're uh, like different conferences have come up with different structures for their schedule or like their adapted schedule that they're now playing. But yeah. the SEC's format, like they're just going 10 games all in conference whereas like the ACC is going 10 in conference in conference games plus uh, one non-conference Big 12 is 9 and 1 and but but the SEC is uh, all in conference games which I guess is a little more ideal like you're within less people if, if you go all in conference but they certainly SEC if, if anyone has the resources to run in conference and still have that revenue it's definitely them well, that looks like uh, Notre Dame is joining the ACC. Yes. Yeah, they are. They're going to be eligible for the ACC championship. That will be interesting. Yeah. I'm guessing we're going to see a Notre Dame-Clemson matchup in, in those finals, assuming the season gets to the end without some spike in coronavirus cases shutting everything down. But hope yeah. for the best. <laughs> Exactly. But then we have like the FCS, the Division Two, Division Three, Junior College. Those those guys are not, nobody's playing there. And then the NAIA, from what I can find, it looks like uh, the Great Plains Athletic Conference, Heart of America, Kansas Collegiate Athletic, uh, the Mid-South Conference, the Sun Division only, North Star Athletic Association, and the Sooner Athletic Conference apparently are still trying to you know, swing something for the fall or e into the spring. So, I mean, I know SFU, some of my Fraser up here, they are not playing. Um, I mean, there's a ton of 
logistics with that going across the border and and whatnot. So it'll be interesting to see out of that group who's all playing. But um, the the thing that you know we're going to talk about are these five five players. But there's more, obviously, um, Canadians that are playing down in the states, and um, they unless it's a, I mean, there was a mandate that if they were taking all online courses that they would have to come home. Are any, none of the, do any of these players fall into that category? Uh, have you heard? I think that was like, I, I don't know how that whole rule went down. Cause I definitely saw some of that stuff all over Twitter and, and whatnot too, but I'm not sure if that got like put into effect or if that idea was like kind of shut down where, all student, all international students who are all online would be forced to return to their home countries. I, I'm honestly not sure what happened there because uh, Canadians are still down there. I think that rule kind of got a, or that idea that they'd have to go back kind of just got thrown away, I, I think. Right. So. Well, yeah, we haven't heard anything either, so um, I guess we'll just keep our eye on that. But let's get into it. We've got um, you. We, we're going to talk about five prospects here. Um, some of them we've ranked as CFC forty um, prospects. Some were ranked as a CFC sixty, um, and then some, obviously, all of them were uh, as a CFC one hundred in previous years. So our first one we're going to talk about is um, Amen. And now you know what I'm gonna. I'm just gonna say Amen, and, and uh, Quincy, you can take away with the last name. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, Amen Ogbong Bamiga. Definitely, <laughs> definitely a tough one. And everyone knows I put your name, so I just, I just, you know, didn't even try. But he goes to Oklahoma State. Um, he's a linebacker, six foot one, two thirty five. Uh, from what I can see on this page, you may have an updated um, measurables for him there. But he's from Calgary, Alberta. Played it with the Notre Dame Pride. He's uh, one of the better linebackers that we've seen come out of Canada in the last decade. Uh, what do you think about him, or what's your take on him? Well, uh, he he was the uh, Oklahoma State Cowboys uh, defensive MVP this past year, so he's a uh, he's a big deal down there. It's funny because he was the defensive MVP, and then Chuba Hubbard was the team MVP. So they had a sort of all all Canadian thing going there. But uh, this guy, this guy. Uh, he he can play special teams in addition to his obvious uh, obvious skill at the linebacker position because that's how he worked his way up to the starting to the starting role at linebacker. Like in his earlier years at the school, he was more of a special teams guy. So obviously that brings value to him when draft time comes. Being being a guy who can play special teams because they'll look for him to do that with that build. But this guy he he's a true linebacker. Like he up north. And probably in in the NFL because he could be a day three pick in the NFL. Like he projects as like a Mac or a Will, so he's like a true linebacker, not really one of those linebacker DB hybrids or one yeah. of those like edge rusher type of guys. He, like he won't have his his hand in the ground. He's a true linebacker, but he's definitely a he's a sure tackler when he's on the field. He had a hundred tackles last year which might have been team leading. And he was also second team all Big 12. So he's definitely having his fair share of success down there as a Canadian. But what do you remember about him coming out of like a high school when, we, when you had first ranked him as a CFC 100? What were your thoughts or where did you see him going? Uh, he's one of the better linebacker prospects I think I've seen in a long, long time. Uh, he was just like... His film was like one of those ones you'd watch it and be like awestruck uh, because of how much more athletic he was than everybody else. <laughs> and when you watch linebacker film, you'll see like there's linebackers that will just do things that are sudden. So like they'll close on the ball carrier and then they're all over them or they'll get to the point of contact and they run right through it and completely obliterate the ball carrier. So, like, he, these are things he always does. Mm -hmm. When I first scouted him, I compared him to um, um, Hanok Mwamba, the CFL linebacker. But then after you see the last two years at Oklahoma State, you're like, no, he's actually going to be better than the CFL All-Star. Or that's my personal opinion. So, yeah, 
the best word to describe him in high school was like, well, there's two words, uh, sudden and violent. So those are the two words yeah. I him. So, yeah, he's awesome. Yeah, and, he'll, he'll, yeah, and he's going into his uh, draft year. He's coming into his red shirt senior year. So uh, look for him to, to make waves come next spring around draft time. Yeah, he'll be, he'll be an exciting one to, to watch for sure. Our next one is uh, Samuel Emilis. He uh, go, goes to UMass. He's a wide receiver, six foot one, 200 pounds, out of Quebec. Um, he's a Vanier College product. Um, and Vanier, like, they always, they're known for turning out, like, amazing athletes. Um, but he's another impressive player. Uh, give us your thoughts on him. Yeah, unlike Amen Ogbong Bamiga, as of right now, he will not, as of right now, Emilis won't be playing this fall because uh, UMass has canceled their fall football season. Right. But Samuel Emilis, he, he's a, he's a, I was quite impressed by him. I watched his last, his highlights from his last year at Sejep, and I was kind of like, my mind was blown as to, uh, how he didn't have more offers because I'm pretty sure his only offer was from UMass. But like when he was at Vanier College, he ran a four five eight forty. So you'd think he's at least that fast now. Yeah. But this guy, he's a guy who's he accelerates very fast and as a after he gets the ball in his hands as a receiver, like he makes shifty shifty cuts and can definitely avoid defenders but on top of uh, his ability to uh, make defenders miss and that great acceleration he has off off the line um the thing that will definitely catch your eye most is his great hands like his first four four clips on that highlight tape from his last year at Sejep yeah like three of those first four plays like they are re- like they're jaw dropping catches like he can he can go up there and get the ball one hand diving, whatever it, whatever it may be. He has, he has Mm -hmm. some pretty spectacular hands. Mm -hmm. Clint, do you, when you saw him, did you, uh, cause this, he was, we didn't write him as a 60 though for Vanny, did we? I don't know if we did or we may have at the end. I know that like sometimes at Vanny kids get caught up cause there's so much talent at that school and they have a a tendency to run the football and play really good defense. Mm -hmm. So it's not shocking that he probably kind of fell under the radar a little bit. And I can probably guarantee you, or probably about 80% guarantee you, he probably flew under the radar, and then I bet you he went to a camp either near UMass or at UMass, and they actually saw him in person at 6'1", like 200 pounds or that range, and he ran his 4'5'8", and that's probably why they offered him on the spot. So... And then he probably committed super quick, so I, I'm pretty sure that's how that happened. But he wasn't a big name even in CJ, uh, even through his senior season. I think he had a pretty good senior season, but like he wasn't like one of the headliners that year. Uh, there was a couple of other receivers who ended up going to like Old Dominion and, and some yeah, other Frederick Antoine. Yeah, like he was the headliner that year. At a, if I think it's the same year, was the headliner coming out of Quebec that year and. His film was, like, just out of this world. So, Samuel, like, at, like honestly, at Vanier, they play great defense and run the ball. And they just don't have enough footballs at Vanier. Because, like, you, you, I mean, if, as a college coach, you would go and recruit the backups at Vanier. But, and, like, not even joking around. I mean, there's so many kids who have come out of that program who have ended up in the CFL uh, and a couple in the NFL. So, not a shocker that he went kind of under the radar, but... Yeah, I watched his highlight too. He's kind of freaky and kind of came out of nowhere. But yeah, he's got some pretty impressive traits. I mean, is that how heavy he is now? Is two hundred pounds? Yeah, six one two hundred. Okay. Because so like those numbers right. is huge. When you said he ran a four five eight, that's that's a pretty big deal. Yeah, he. I like. I just see him. I I think he's like all around just a. <laughs> just a really good receiver like I think he deserves more credit than he gets but even even in college right now like this past season I feel like he could fly under the radar even now a little bit this past season he only had 273 yards receiving which made him the which made him third on his team in receiving yards 
But I, yeah. I was just, I was kind of surprised by that, given, like, how good he looks on film. So I, like, went in and, and looked at the rest of the team's stats a little. And UMass is, uh, they're not a very good FBS team, <laughs> as I'm, I'm sure you guys know. And uh, they, like, their leading receiver in terms of yards, like, just to think, first of all, they spread the ball around, like, quite evenly on, on the at all so no no one's numbers are really that good but on top of that their g- numbers in general just aren't very good as a team because they're not that good yeah. but um their number one receiver only had something like 350 yards receiving so it's like a range of like 75 yards between like their number one receiver and their number three receiver and then like their number four receiver had something like something like 250 so it's like there are four receivers all within like that 350 to 250 yards receiving range so like i think his his production doesn't exactly do him justice as a player or in that system yeah well it's too bad we couldn't you know it'll be interesting to see you know this will be a great opportunity for them to train like a beast and you know however they decide to run their practices if they can with social distancing and you know maybe something in the spring we can who knows right no maybe they should just recruit a court yeah. UMass <laughs> uh, yeah, U- yeah UMass I, I was just surprised like I'm looking at UMass roster and uh, their starting quarterback coming into this year is he's 5'8 like yeah. you buy eight one seventy, and yeah. and I kind of just looked at that, and it's like like just their offense isn't very good. <laughs> wow! But yeah, because that sort of thing wouldn't really slide at a at a top school. I, now I'm not I'm not going to judge this guy based off his height because you know there's there's Doug Flutie and everything, but I am. But, yeah. <laughs> there's only one Doug Flutie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I doubt. I doubt he's Doug Flutie, though. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Well, on that note, look, good luck to them. Um, <laughs> the next, the next dude is uh, Liam Dobson. He's uh, goes to Maine. He's um, an offensive lineman, six foot three, three hundred and forty pounds. Um, out of Ottawa, was at St. Mark's and then went to Canada Prep, from what I understand. Um, Clint has yeah. always said that he's Canada Canada's version of Marshall Yanda, uh, just straight up road grader. What? Uh, give us your take on Liam. Yeah, he's at, at six three, three hundred and forty pounds. Uh, well, first of all, there's there's this pretty impressive video exhibiting his explosiveness of him him dunking a basketball at that weight, which is what? pretty impressive. <laughs> it's pretty impressive, yes. <laughs> but you'll see that explosiveness in, in the way he plays on the field. He's as an O lineman, his his punch and drive are both very powerful. Like he'll hit you hard and just keep pushing. And that that power and explosiveness was exhibited in, in his uh, play on the field. As he had, he averaged a very impressive twelve knockdowns per game as an offensive lineman. But he, he was the team's most uh, outstanding offensive lineman this past year, and he played right tackle for them. But as a professional prospect, he's definitely more of a guard. He, he's just not very... He's a little little thick. He's, he's just built more like a guard, and he's not exactly, um, not exactly tall to be, to be a prospect. Like, he's, he's just definitely a guard, and in the future as a prospect and as as uh clint alluded to he's definitely mean and relentless as as a blocker <laughs> yeah. well we had ranked him as a guard when he when he was to, like, up here in canada what uh what do you think clint oh uh, yeah i don't know if it's still up or if you can find it his uh his uh high school tape or his senior tape or his pg tape if you want to be specific he was just like obliterating people. So like he's the lineman that latches onto you, and then like 
continues to play to the whistle and then a little bit past the whistle <laughs> then all of a sudden he'll drop the flag or on that particular play he may feel like getting a flag and just punch somebody in the head <laughs> so like when you watch his film i've seen him play in person too back then and then you got the impression that like he was like literally he was playing the game like i said it in the past like he, he was in a bar fight so it's like he literally is playing in a, a team game, but he, he wants so bad to just destroy the person across the room. So like, yeah, I'm, as, yeah, so. yeah. As, as a prospect, like I'd, I'd say uh, that sometimes his sort of uh, explosiveness and, and power that like maybe perhaps at times he relies a little too much on that. And sometimes his, his base can get a little narrow and like the technique can get a little, uh, like, obviously he's still very good. I, I don't have to say that, but, um, he, like his, his, he allows his base to get a little narrow and kind of relies a little more on just solely his strength and just like, just being physically dominant. So that, that could be cleaned up a little, but he's definitely going to be a top offensive lineman prospect in the upcoming CFL draft but in terms of that transition to the CFL on the same note I also see that in his in his highlights I would have liked to see more pass blocking given that the CFL is obviously a bit more of a passing game but um there were only like two or three clips of him pass blocking in his highlight tape and that's obviously something that he'd have to work on as a as a uh, CFL prospect, but as a run blocker, he's, he's definitely mean and he, he's just nasty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we enjoyed watching Liam's films for sure. It'll be an interesting transition for him because he's used to physically dominating D lineman. So when he moves inside, that'll be a transition. And when he plays against like high end defensive linemen, because I know you, uh, main, they're dominant at their level, but, when he goes against professional athletes, if he even got a CFL shot at 6'3", is kind of iffy. But if he goes to the CFL, he's going to go against some pretty good interior D linemen. It'll be interesting to see how he transitions from a run-blocking wizard who played outside to an interior offensive lineman who now has to pass pro or set like 80% of the time. So, yeah, totally backing up with Yeah, Yeah, with like exactly what, exactly what you said, like as he as he transitions to the CFL, you wonder if like, kind of like I, I said earlier, like he has that, uh, he kind of at times allows his power and strength, allow him to rely a little more on that than the technique, but going up against a top D lineman at, at the professional level, he'll have, you'll have to hone that a little bit. Yeah. Well, we'll watch for that for sure. Our next, Guy is Olivier Charles Pierre. He's a six foot two, three hundred forty five pound defensive lineman out of Quebec. Uh, went to Cégep College de Montreal, um, but he also played at uh, NNMI, uh, New Mexico Military Institute uh, Junior College. He's a uh, he's at Houston. He's a prototypical nose tackle, big, wide, hard to move. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know what? Uh, give us your your download on Olivier. Yeah, well, he, he definitely moves like he's lighter than 345, but yeah, three, 345, he's uh, kind of kind of built like a, a run stuff in those tackle, obviously. But um, to, I, I found it interesting, going back to his older highlights, he, was, he used to be like 310, 315 pounds. So yeah. I'm kind of curious as to why he's, up to up to 345 now like i i guess just solely being a a run stuffing guy like that that can work but say as a as a cfl prospect for the upcoming draft because he's just like uh amen ogbong bamiga and um liam dobson he's going to be in the uh, upcoming draft class so you just wonder like as, as a cfl guy in a more wide spread out field in a in a passing game like you just think he's he's gonna have to drop some weight to uh to uh succeed at the next level but he's definitely still for his weight the way he moves his 
very impressive because I find some D tackles kind of some or like your uh, prototypical run stuffing nose tackles kind of allow their tackling style to be more of a kind of just swallow up what comes to them. But Charles Pierre actually goes out and like I find he uh, makes those tackles and he he moves pretty athletically for a guy that size. Like he'll make outstretched tackles or like diving whatever to uh, get get a hold on those guys. So he's definitely mobile at his size. And that, that impressed me a lot, but he could also definitely lose some as a prospect. Mm -hmm. Clint, did you see him when you were at McGill? Did you see him in person there at all? At Momo? Yeah. Because I think College of Montreal is probably his, his high school. His, oh, his, his CJ probably most likely was uh, Momo Rase. Okay. So like Momo. Yeah, yeah it was. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, the fact that he probably played four years of CJ and then went down to NMMI, so... He probably played six years of football prior to going to university. Uh, where he's at Houston, so he probably was last last year was year one for him. But I, I, yeah. I he was always like he was always twitchy. But you would look at his body and you'd be like, "There's no way he's athletic." And then he would do <laughs> something and you'd be like, "Holy cow, he's athletic for his build." Um, yeah, I don't think he's six foot two, but uh, he he would make he would he were always. He always got me as like he's the he's the, the prospect that looked like a true nose, but also was like a one gap penetrator. Uh, and I'm not going to compare him to like a Warren Sapp, but like a one gap penetrator who, when asked, could could anchor and like sink a double team. And then he does. He makes these plays yeah. where he finds out of the line of scrimmage, and he'll actually he will make an open field tackle, or he will actually get down. Yeah change direction and his body lean and you'll actually dive and make plays that would almost look like a linebacker play. And there's a couple times where he just simply planted people as well. So, I mean, he is yeah. crazy athletic and just once again, with Quincy's point, if he dropped down to like 310 or even 300, I, I think it would be scary to see what he would do. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah. He's, uh, well, I mean, it'll, again, this this time with the pandemic, the CFL draft is, you know, it's going to be interesting again, I'm sure. And Well, he's probably going well, to, he's in Houston, right? So he's playing this year. Is he not? Yeah. Yeah, yeah he is. Yeah. He's, he's, he's one of the guys him. still playing. Yeah. He'll get some film. Yeah, he looks like a, a traditional nose. And then he'll be, all of a sudden, he'll do something. You're like, wow, he's a one-gap penetrating like three technique, but he's definitely not built like yeah. so. Well, well, we'll we'll keep our eye on him as well. Our last prospect that we're going to be talking about is um, Daniel Adabobe. How did I do there, Quincy? Did I get it? It, it, it was all right. <laughs> <laughs> Just nice. say it, it was wrong. It was totally wrong. <laughs> Big fail. Hard fail. Anyway, he's a running back, 5'11", 215 pounds, plays at Bryant. Um, he's out of Toronto, uh, went to the Hill School. Um, you can say his name and give us your take on him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Daniel Adababoye. Baboye. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah he, out, out on the field, uh, he, he looks like a natural runner with uh, good instincts. And in, in, in terms of... Uh, getting the ball in his hands. He can kind of kind of do it in all ways. Like, he can run inside, run outside. He can catch screen passes. And that, that'll definitely uh, strike you when, you when you watch his film. And as, as, a, as a runner, uh, he certainly... He, he does a good job at, at... At the end of his runs, he tends to drag those defenders for, like, that extra, like, one, two yards, which is something you definitely like to see. Like, he's, he's a guy who's, like, as sometimes said like he he falls forward when being tackled so yeah. he gets those uh extra one two yards at the end of his runs but this is a guy he he looks looks athletic running like i'm pretty sure he runs like a four five ish or, or like somewhere in the four fives if i remember correctly so he 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 looks pretty good out out on the field but one thing i would certainly like to see is uh him blocking because i went through his past two years of, of tape at uh, Bryant and then his senior year at the Hill School, like you said. And there was not a single clip of 
him blocking through any three of those videos, which that, wow. that could be whether that means he hides it because he's not good at it or he it, it could just be a case of a mistake that like a lot of running backs make on their film where they tend to just leave out blocking yeah so it, it's either yeah it's either he's he's not good at it or he could just simply be like overlooking it in his in his film but that's definitely something he should get on there and as a, I mean, we ranked him at number 11 as a CSC 100. Clint, what do you remember about him? Oh, I remember him just running. He was always, like, running behind his pads. So, like, he was always leaning forward and finishing runs. Those are the, I, that's what, when I saw his name, that's what I remember. And, and at the, the school, the Hill School, he was pretty much the same size he is now, maybe minus 10 pounds. And he was literally running over people there as well. I always thought that he was like maybe some of the reasons he didn't get like a whole bunch of offers was he probably isn't fast enough, like like super like fifth gear breakaway fast. Uh, and the other yeah. thing, but he was always I always thought he was a power runner, and I was like, wow, he finishes his runs, or wow, he squeezes out two or three yards. But to be like that super duper complete back, you have to have the fifth gear, uh, and obviously you already mentioned it. You have to demonstrate that you can pass pro. And then the other thing yeah. that he does an okay job at, he's great at finishing runs. Uh, you kind of see him on his film sometimes where he'll get taken down by the first defender, or he may not make, like, the great running backs will make the first two guys miss. And then they do all that other crazy stuff. He kind of, like, runs into contact and then, like, drags them. Mm -hmm. So those are some of the kind of things that stuck out. The fact that he played so much as a freshman and headed into a sophomore or a sophomore into junior... That, that's a big credit to him, though, because you don't see too many Canadian backs. I mean, name one outside of Chubba Hubbard that you remember who was, like, a super dominant back in the NCAA who was actually a starter. I mean, you could probably pick him off, but there's not a lot of them. So, so I remember him just being a power back and finishing all of his runs and being like, wow, that was impressive. And the Hill School, I think it's more of an academic school, but still playing football in Pennsylvania and or Ohio. Uh, you're going to be playing good high school yeah, football. Yeah, good, good ball for sure. Yeah, and last year his production, 605 rushing yards as a uh, true sophomore on that Bryant team. He was their leading rusher as, yeah. as a true sophomore, and that was he missed a handful of games. I'm pretty sure he missed three games too, so that just makes it all the more impressive. Yeah, he'll run for 1,000 as a junior. Jeez. Think about it, like, yeah. unless, unless they bring somebody in who's like out of this world, so... I mean, they're not playing. They're not playing next year, are they? Oh uh, no, yeah, they're they're not playing this so fall. Year. So he will get another year after Chuba Hubbard breaks a thousand or two thousand again. Maybe you'll have another thousand yard rush of the year following that. Yeah. So wouldn't yeah, it be crazy? crazy? You'd love to see that. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Chuba Hubbard like won the Heisman, and, and Amen. Not saying his last name. Was somehow in the mix for the for the the Buckus. huh? I don't know about that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that 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 would be nice to see. Unfortunately, it kind of seems like the Heisman's become like this quarterback award, or like strictly quarterback, which isn't really exactly. It's become what what's the award that goes to the most impressive quarterback? The Maxwell. Mm -hmm. Oh. I, wh whatever it is, it's basically like, uh, it's, uh, the Heisman's kind of become that. So it's it, kind of like. Is it the Max? The Max the Maxwell? Maxwell? Is it some Maxwell. Who knows? There's so many of those individual position awards. I thought it was something like O'Brien. Yeah, it is. I think it is. I think Maxwell, uh, cause then there's like the Ben Nerick, which is a defensive lineman linebacker. Then the running back one seems to be the one people talk about the most. Oh, they, yeah, the, uh... Dope Walker. The, uh, yeah, the Dope, yeah, yeah, Dope yeah. Walker Award. You see a running back will finish second in the Heisman and get the Dope, and they'll be like, oh, well, he got the Dope. I don't yeah. know who Walker is. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kind of think Chuba Hubbard got snubbed from the Dope Walker last year, but, I mean, may, maybe I'm a little biased, who knows? Yeah. Probably. <laughs> but. You're a lot yeah. 
allowed to be. Yeah. You're a teenager in Ontario. You're allowed to be. <laughs> just, just proud, just proud of my Canadian guys out there. There you go. Yep. Well, that's great. Uh, that's some great info. I know for sure we'll, we're gonna keep, keep talking about more more kids down there, and we'll keep our eye on how things progress as the the term of the year seems to be fluid. So uh, I'm sure that there's going to be more changes being made um, just on the fly and who knows what's going to happen in the springtime. So uh, we'll keep our eye on that. So uh, thanks for joining us, Quincy. It was great, um, great insight that you had. Um, so that's it for us today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Recruiting Masters. Like I said, be sure to follow us on our social media, on Facebook, Twitter, at Chat Football. CFC underscore football YouTube and don't forget uh, to check out our digital store um, for all of that those great recruiting tools that will help you get to the next level. This has been the Recruiting Masters brought to you by the CFC Insider. Have a great week everyone.